in this video, um, I'll be looking through 25 to 30 or so quotations, key quotations from Sebastian Falk's novel Birdsong, trying to reduce this um, novel down to 30 quotations is an almost impossible task. And you could go through and do the same task and pick 30 completely different quotations to, to sum up what you think is special about this wonderful novel. And it almost seems inappropriate to do it. But I hope that in, in doing this, um, I've selected a series of quotations which will be helpful to you in answering any number of questions on theme and character. The main focus of this presentation is on Stephen, and I'll be doing separate videos to cover the other characters, um, such as Weir and Firebrace. The quotations are in, in chronological order, which hopefully will be um, also a useful recap of the novel. And we start in um, part one here, and there are only two quotations I've selected from part one. And this one is part of a dream that Stephen has. Uh, he was trying to help a trapped bird out of the window, its wings battered frantically on the glass. Now, birds are obviously an important motif in this novel. Um, especially given the title. And birds seem to represent um, a number of things, but certainly they represent freedom and possibility. Um, and that is perhaps why Stephen is so afraid of birds, at this, particularly at the start of the novel. It's a fear that seems to dissipate as the novel progresses. But here we see his, his fear of birds and his fear of the freedom and possibility that they represent. As brilliant as this novel is, there are one or two quite clunky metaphors in it. And this, this is one of the clunkier metaphors in that the bird is clearly um, Isabel here and Stephen is trying to free in some way um, Isabel from the restrictions of her gender and, and her marriage. So in the same way that Stephen is afraid of birds, he is in some way, I think, also afraid of Isabel because of the possibility that she offers, the sense of freedom and liberation that she offers him. He enjoys, but he is also terrified by it. And that brings us on to this quotation about Isabel on page 58. This is a novel. Yes, it's a novel about the effects of World War I. But it's also, in lots of ways, a novel about transition, about a world in transition and about people in transition and the way in which the world transformed individuals, transformed the world as a whole, transformed society, transformed what it meant to be a man, transformed what it meant to be a woman. And that's why I think this quotation is so important. Isabel wanted to bring alive what she had buried and to demean, destroy her fabricated self. This is very much a quotation about an individual, but also about gender. Isabel is a character who is restricted by the expectations of femininity in the early 20th century and in the society in which she lives. And Stephen offers her the opportunity to free herself from those um, restrictions and from the restrictive world in which she lives. And it's the violence which I think is so striking in this quotation. She doesn't just want to progress. She wants to de demean and destroy the woman that she used to be. Um, and in lots of ways, she succeeds in doing that. And um, she uses Stephen as a vehicle to help her do that. And then um, eventually she finds her liberation through the birth of their child. And now we move on to the war sections of the novel. This is right at the opening of part two, the first page of part two on page 121. And it's significant, I think, that we start with Jack Firebrace and not Stephen, who is the protagonist of, of the novel. Jack Firebrace, in lots of ways, is the, the everyman, the representative figure in this novel. He represents the people back home. He represents a connection with the life that these soldiers knew before and the life that they hoped to return to. 
he has a family, he has a son, he has a wife, we don't meet them. But he's that character who allows a connection between two worlds which are otherwise so distant. And it's no surprise, therefore, that Jack is in lots of ways the sacrificial figure. And we're going to look at sacrifice quite a lot through these quotations. And here we have another one of Falk's fairly clunky metaphors um, in that Jack, we find Jack buried underground um, and his back was supported by a wooden cross. So in lots of ways, his death is inevitable. Here he is clearly the Christ-like figure. Here is a character who is going to be sacrificed. And the only thing for us to find out is, to whether, is whether he rises again, whether there's any sense of resurrection through Jack. And we'll look at that later on. But the fact that he's buried underground also perhaps foreshadows the inevitability of Jack's death. And it's important that Jack acts as a sacrificial figure. He's probably the most human character in this novel. And therefore, by making him the most human character, his sacrifice serves to highlight the extent of the pain and suffering and the, and the destructive quality of warfare. Stephen's attitude is really important in the novel and we see his attitude change constantly. He is probably the character who is most affected by warfare, not always in a negative sense. This is near um, the beginning of part one, page 150, and Stephen says that this is not a war, this is an exploration of how far men can be degraded. And at the start of Stephen's journey in France, He's fascinated. His purpose is he wants to discover how far men can be dehumanized by warfare. That is what fascinates him. That is what drives him on. And he's absolutely right. We'll look at lots of quotations that um, signify the dehumanizing impact of warfare. And that is part of the pain and suffering that is endured during these sections of the novel. Another important theme in this novel is time and memory. And memory is something that is often portrayed as fleeting in the novel. It's very difficult to hold on to. But what always remains with the soldiers, and we see this with all of the key characters, Stephen and Weir in particular, is that memories of warfare will never go away. These are men who will be forever stuck in this moment in time, unable to escape the impact and the horror of what they've seen. And that's um, captured beautifully by Falks in the use of his word static the burned images of the preceding days lived in his memory with static clarity. And then again on page 217, the passage of the next three days passed in the closing of an eye, yet the images retained a fearful static quality that stayed in the mind until death. Time is a difficult concept in this novel. But on the one hand, things seem to move so fast, particularly in moments of battle. But on the other, there's an almost a cinematic slow motion quality to the events that Falks describes. And we see that in both instances here. Static almost suggests that they're frozen in time. And certainly um, there is the idea that Stephen and the others will never be able to escape the effects of war are all consuming, not just in the moment, but for eternity. Another important theme in the novel, and this is typical of much of the literature of World War I, uh, we see it in other novels such as All Quiet on the Western Front and, and Death of a Hero, is this complete dehumanization and mechanization of the soldiers. And that's because perhaps World War One was the first truly mechanized warfare that the world had ever seen. 
Before that, it had been much more about hand to hand combat. There was hand to hand combat in this war, but it is a war fought at distance for the first time. And throughout this novel, there seems to be a blending of the human and the mechanical. The men become mechanized. They become um, objects of warfare. And this quotation on page 162 captures it perfectly. He watched the men harden to the mechanical slaughter. Mechanical um, suggests the dehumanization, but there's also an animalization of this of these men in the word slaughter. And I think that's why it's a really powerful metaphor to take forward into your to your exam, because it depicts the way in which men are reduced. They're reduced to machines or they're debased as animals. And we get this contrast between and Stephen really um, is the character who is in lots of ways able to escape that dehumanization. Stephen comes into the war a very, very cold character. He's pretty heartless. He's, he's pretty unfeeling, even in his moments of passion and love with Isabel. Um, words like convulsed are used and the reflex of desire. Everything with Stephen is automatic. And Stephen is perhaps the only character who actually finds a sense of humanity during his experiences of the war. So Stephen is a character who shows us, yes, the way in which men are debased and dehumanized and destroyed. But there is also the hope of regeneration and renewal through Stephen's character. And this is the moment where he's been in the explosion underground um, from page 177. And he is dumped with the other um, supposedly dead bodies. But Stephen is still alive. And we see this beautiful juxtaposition here between the physical and the spiritual. Stephen is a character up until this point who has been entirely physical. And we see for the first time a sense of something spiritual or ethereal about Stephen. Then under the indifferent sky, his spirit left his body with its ripped flesh, infections, its weak and damaged nature. The part of him that still lived was unreachable. And the part that still lives is the spirit, not not the physical. He's dying in physical form and it's his spirit which is leaving here. And that's what he has to cling on to. And he does. And as a result of that, Stephen is reinvented. And we see that on page 185, he's been found and he's been taken to hospital. And it says Stephen re-inhabited his body cell by cell. And it's a really powerful depiction by Folks of the way in which Stephen is reduced to nothing, but then is able bit by bit to reform himself. And it is in that way that Stephen offers this hope of renewal and regeneration. This brings us on to religion. We've seen Stephen discovering some sense of spirituality while all the rest of the world around him is losing its spirituality. And we get Horrocks, the priest, the padre. He's only in the novel for a matter of pages, but he really powerfully depicts the way in which religion and belief and faith is destroyed by the horror of warfare. Horrocks is brought in to comfort the men as they go into battle, into the Battle of the Somme, the biggest battle in the novel um, and in World War I. Horrocks in white cassock over khaki trousers, bald head gleaming, was standing with bands and a prayer book on raised ground like a useless earthbound bird. Absolutely brilliant depiction. First of all, in his white cassock over his khaki trousers, we almost see in that juxtaposition of his religious uniform and the military uniform, we see the clash of the two worlds and they don't seem to fit together. They are incongruous in so many ways. And Falk seems to be keen to make an example of Horrocks. His bald head is gleaming, it is standing out and he is on raised ground because religious faith needs to be made of an ex made an example of at this moment. It doesn't fit in this hell-like world that they're inhabiting. And then we get this 
brilliant simile, like a useless earthbound bird. Hassock and religion has lost its purpose here. It no longer has a purpose. It no longer has um, a sense of belonging. It has to reform itself and reshape itself in order to fit into this changed world. And this is such a common theme of the literature of World War I, the godlessness of the battlefield, because how can a god exist? There has to be a questioning of God's existence in a world where men are causing such destruction to the world and to each other. This quotation, I think, is a is a beautiful one, and it comes during the Battle of the Somme. And this is about Stephen, and it very much encapsulates that transformative quality of Stephen. He was hunched like an old woman in the cocoon of tearing noise, hunched like an old wom woman. Again, he's been destroyed in some way. He's been made older. He's closer to death. But Stephen also gives us the hope of regeneration and renewal with that metaphor of the cocoon. This is a transformative state. He's going through some sort of metamorphosis and he will come out the other side of it, um, perhaps something more beautiful um, and something more sustainable. And then at the end of this section, um, the end of the Battle of the Somme, we get the notion that the world is forever changed. The world will never be the same again after the horrors of what they have seen. And Stephen listens and he hears the groaning men rising from the ground. And it sounds to Stephen as if the soil itself is protesting and he hears the sound of a new world. It is not a happy world and it is not a hopeful world, but it is a new world nonetheless. And Stephen is really the only character who is able to recognise that. Nature is regurgitating the men here. It is refusing to accept them. But in, ref in refusing, there is a sense of these men being reborn. Reborn as what? We don't know. Something monstrous, maybe. But for Stephen, there is at least the acceptance of something new. And with that comes the hope of renewal and regeneration. This is from part three of the novel. This is when we jump forward 60 years to um, Elizabeth's section of the novel, and it's England 1978. This section of the novel and Elizabeth's purpose in the novel is, is really in the main to highlight the gap of experience and the distance that exists and the lack of understanding that exists and perhaps the futility of what the men fought for. And this is never more powerfully depicted than when she visits um, the Thiepval Memorial. And in so many ways, this memorial is inappropriate. It stands out. It looks to Elizabeth like a building of the Third Reich. It doesn't fit in with its surroundings. And it's when she approaches it that we clearly see the not only the extent of the suffering, but her her misunderstanding of the suffering and her inability to comprehend. Their chiselled capitals rose from the level of her ankles to the height of the great arch itself. On every surface of every column, as far as her eye could see, there were names teeming, reeling, surfaces of yards over hundreds of yards over furlongs of stone. Brilliant piece of writing. And if we look at the repetition, first of all, of every and every, and the use of listing and the repetition of over and over, Folks really powerfully depicts the extent of the suffering. And let's remember, these are only the lost men in this battle. The found ones are in a, in a colossal um, cemetery. And he uses assonance brilliantly as well, doesn't he, in teeming and reeling to give us that sense of scale and an enormitude. Their chiseled capitals, this is the remembrances in many ways inappropriate isn't it? 
it's huge, it's coarse, it's harsh, it doesn't really fit with the purpose of what this memorial is trying to capture. And the second quote, second section I'm looking at here from um, part three is when Elizabeth then goes home into the attic and she discovers the, um, the box of uh, memorabilia from Stephen's time in the warfare, in the war. And the parcel fell apart limply, dropping its guts into her hands. We clearly see um, the connection here that these documents provide for Elizabeth. They allow her to connect in some ways with the past. But the way in which the parcel falls apart limply again shows us that this is a loose, almost inappropriate and certainly an ineffective connection with the past, highlighting the impossibility of ever truly remembering what happened. And the notebook that she finds, the diary, is written in what she um, thinks is Greek script. It's important that this diary is written in code because it reveals to us the difficulty, almost impossibility of truly understanding. And I think it's significant that Elizabeth believes it to be written in Greek script. There's almost something of an ancient civilization about the notebook. Even though this is only 60 years after the end of the war, the two worlds are so far detached that they might as well be separated by thousands of years. And then we're back to um, back to France, and Stephen returns to um, Amiens, and he goes on leave, and he returns to Amiens, and he the cathedral is mentioned twice. They walked past the cathedral, which was sandbagged to the level of the lower windows, and then again on three two four, he left the cathedral behind him, its cold Gothic shape fortified by the stacked bags full of earth, as though its spiritual truths were not in themselves proof against exploding metal. This is very much about religion and the way in which religion has been destroyed. It is being held up, but its demise appears to be inevitable. It has also lost its, um, it's lost its meaning. Its spiritual truths can no longer be taken as fact. They're no longer proof against exploding metal. This is war's ability to destroy even things which have stood the test of time for thousands and thousands of years. War is utterly destructive. But Stephen can find, again, a sense of hope. He walks away from that, um, that sense of religion and he walks towards the canal and he finds the nature down there and finds a sense of renewal in it. So it's a new reality, but Stephen is able to exist in it and find his place in it. And here we get uh, Stephen's meeting with Isabel on his return to Amiens. It's only a short section, but it is really a, quite a significant one. Um, there's lots of reference in there to, to Isabel's scar is important, something seemingly indestructible at the start of the novel, something seemingly so perfect. War has left its mark on Isabel. But Isabel also notices the way in which war has left its mark on Stephen. He seemed a man removed to some new existence where he was dug in and fortified by his lack of natural feeling or response. I think the language is important here, dug in and fortified, words very much in the semantic field of warfare. She recognises that Stephen, in lots of ways, will be forever stuck in those experiences of war. But she also recognises that he's moved on in some way, it's some new existence, and it's a new world that he now, now inhabits. And she cannot reach out to it. So yes, Stephen has moved somewhere else. And this really powerfully depicts the um, disconnect between the world pre-war and the world after it. Things have changed. And as strong as their connection was before the war, their connection can never be reformed because Isabel has no way of understanding 
what Stephen's experiences were. And she therefore has no way of understanding the man he has now become and the world that he now inhabits. Um, once again, I, I've selected this one because it's a really short metaphor. So it's very easy to remember, but it captures so many of the key and important effects of warfare. The mechanized abattoir, as Stephen refers to, to the conflict here. It really powerfully highlights the way in which men have de been dehumanized um, and animalized by the effects of warfare. They've been completely reduced. And if you link that into the mechanized, um, the mechanized warfare that we see here, we see the way in which the warfare has affected these men. And there is, in that word abattoir, there is um, a sense that um, the men have been completely destroyed. There is no way back for them. But as there is no way back for so many of the men, there is a way back for Stephen. And once again, he reveals to us this ability of his to be renewed and to be regenerated and to find a new sense of hope in a world which has changed. This is where he goes on leave and he returns to England. And I think perhaps Stephen is able to find this sense of renewal and regeneration and freshness in England because he had no sense of belonging originally. When Weir returns, he goes back to his family and all it does for Weir is to remind him how far detached he is from his family. For Stephen, he doesn't have that. He had nowhere to go. It was only on Weir's suggestion that he ended up here. But there has a feeling of purity as though it had never been breathed. Brilliant. This is a new world. It's entirely something separate from the world he knew before. He could see the tower of the church, so religion hasn't been completely destroyed here. And there, these and the forgiving distance of the sky were not separate, but part of one creation. And he too, by the repeated tiny pulsing of his blood. Forgiving distance, this is an interesting phrase for Stephen, a man who was before so afraid of possibility and freedom, now finds it forgiving. And the world for Stephen has become one. He's found a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging in contrast to so many other men who have been completely dislocated from the world they previously knew. And it's perhaps because Stephen didn't really know a world before his role in World War I. He never had a sense of belonging. And pulse is an important word in this novel. And here we see Stephen coming alive again. If we remember that quotation, Stephen re-inhabited his body cell by cell. The process is continuing and he feels that sense of being alive at this moment. This is Weir's death on page 385. It's the, possibly the most tragic moment in, in a tragic novel. Weir is at his happiest at this particular moment. He's relaxed, he's enjoying himself, he's smiling, and he raises his head above the parapet and he's shot. Then it fell like a puppet, its limbs shooting out and the face smashing into the mud. First of all, we see again the dehumanization here. Weir is referred to as it and its limbs and the face. There is no sense of identity now for Weir. He has been completely stripped of what he was before. The puppet is a really um, powerful simile because it highlights the way in which the men are controlled by a higher power, whether that's fate or God or the authorities or the generals. Um, we're left to decide for ourselves, but these are certainly men who are controlled, who are not in control of their own destiny. And then we get another Christ-like reference. It's limbs shooting out. Weir spreads his arms wide as he falls to the earth here. So we get another moment of sacrifice. And it's probably appropriate that Weir is sacrificed at the moment he is most 
happy because it reveals to us the arbitrary nature of suffering in warfare. It can happen at any time. And it's probably appropriate that it happens at Weir's happiest time because it highlights how indiscriminate warfare and its suffering can be. This is now in Elizabeth's second section in the novel. And she continues to try to make a connection with the past and she calls up Grey in Scotland, but Grey sounds distant and she can't connect with him. She then goes to see Brennan and Brennan has been stuck in this this home, um, a kind of old people's home, but um, for pretty much his entire post-war life. He's never left it. Um, and, we're, and Brennan is a character who it is clear that psychologically he has never left the world of war. He exists in this new world but in his mind, he has never left France. And this simile really powerfully depicts it. He is like a bird on its perch. He seems to be a man who is teetering between two worlds. He's also a man for whom there is no freedom. A bird on its perch is a caged bird. So it highlights the way in which Brennan is trapped and he's trapped in a kind of purgatory between the world he's now trying to live in and the world of war where he seems stuck psychologically. It's a very, very sad moment for um, Elizabeth and for the reader. Um, this again is um, Stephen's words, but it's in his journal. It's, it's a letter that has been um, translated for Elizabeth and, and so we're seeing it through Elizabeth's eyes but it's Stephen's words and I've included it all because I think it's a really powerful sec, um, section of text at this end of the part of the novel, Elizabeth's second part. I do not know what I have done to live in this existence. I do not know what any of us did to tilt the world into this unnatural orbit. No child or future generation will ever know what this was like. They will never understand. We will talk and sleep and go about our business like human beings. We will seal what we have seen in the silence of our hearts and no words will reach us. This clearly, it does so much. It depicts the way in which the world has been changed forever for Stephen and the soldiers and for everyone. But it also in some way Relieves the, relieves the sense of blame that we attach to Elizabeth and her generation for not remembering and not understanding, because Stephen reveals to us here that they can never understand. Firstly, they can never understand because they have no context to really understand the suffering that these men endured, because the suffering was so unique and so new and so personal but also because the men did not have the way, the ways in which to discuss it. See, they will seal it in the silence of their hearts. Not only because they don't want to tell it because it's too painful, but they don't have the vocabulary to say what happened to them. They cannot capture um, the experiences of World War I because the world doesn't have the ability to express what happened to them, so unique is their experience. But my favourite simile here is when Stephen says we will go about our business like human beings. Well normally a simile is used to compare a human being to some, something else, here a simile is used to compare the soldiers to human beings. They will act as if they are, they are human again but the soldiers will never be human as we know it to be. Um, once again, Stephen then um, finds this sense of renewal and it continues, doesn't it? Um, there were no distinct worlds, only one creation to which he was bound by the beating of his blood. And we see the transition from the pulse to the beating of his blood. He's becoming more and more alive as this novel progresses 
as opposed to every other soldier who is becoming closer and closer to death. This is a series of quotations from Jack Firebrace's final moments in the, the novel. And these moments are really about Jack Firebrace as a representation of faith in the novel. Jack Firebrace entombed in his heavy burial place. Well, with that word entombed, that is clearly a Christ-like reference. And Jack is a changed character, a man whose spirit and religious faith was seemingly unbreakable. Even as he learns of his son's death, he reveals to us his continued faith in God. But now that seems to have gone. There was no consideration beyond the body in the darkness of the tunnel. What was done by them in the earth with their hands and legs and voices was the boundary of it all. Jack has lost that sense of spirituality and he has become the entirely physical being that Stephen was at the start of the novel. They seem to have switched places now. Stephen is a character who is finding the potential of spirituality. Jack is slowly losing it and he then therefore says get me off this cross. He is no longer willing to be this religious, spiritual, sacrificial figure. And it's probably appropriate that his death is a very physical one, not necessarily a spiritual one. The hacking, rattling sound filled the narrow space, then stopped. The way in which Falks captures the sounds here with hacking and rattling and the plosive qualities of those words make this a very physical death. It's not the death we might have imagined for Jack earlier in the novel and it highlights to us highlights to us the way in which war can destroy. Stephen however in contrast to Jack and this is shortly afterwards on page 481 Stephen is becoming increasingly alive. He was alive with a passion for the world for the stars and trees and the people who moved and lived in it. I think these references are important. The stars are in many, way, many ways a representation of the heavens. Trees are clearly a representation of nature and people is a representation of humanity. So Stephen in his regeneration and renewal seems to be reforming the world for us. There is hope here for a united world and universe that re re reunites religion nature and people in one creation as Stephen refers to it. It's a new reality but it is a reformed reality and it is Stephen who allows us that possibility. And this is Stephen's final moment in the novel on page 483. The resolution came to him and he found his arms still raised began to spread and open. Levi looked at this wild eyed figure, half demented, his brother's killer. For no reason he could tell, for no reason, for no reason he could tell, he found that he had opened his own arms in turn, and the two men fell upon each other's shoulders, weeping at the bitter strangeness of their human lives. An absolutely brilliant moment for Stephen. Like Firebrace and like Weir, he has his final moment with this sort of Christ-like reference, his arms spread open again. But unlike Weir and unlike Firebrace, there is also the hope, the Christ-like hope of regeneration and resurrection, because this isn't a moment of death for Stephen. This is a moment of renewal. And what is renewed? is his faith and therefore our faith in the possibility of humanity because what comes together here are the two enemies a british soldier and a german soldier and a british soldier who was killed the german soldier's brother but they are still able to unite in this embrace and that gives the novel its message of hope a novel which in so many ways depicts to us the utter destructive quality of warfare 
also gives us the possibility of something new to come from this experience.